I'm really so happy that we've been able to get um, Professor uh, Jenny Hewison, who's Professor of Psychology um, at um, the University of Leeds. Um, Jenny has been a part of the NIHR ever before the NIHR existed and has been absolutely pivotal in transforming how the NIHR developed. Um, she has uh, considerable experience um, in uh, research commissioning for NIHR uh, and has chaired panels for the HTA program for the program grants for applied health research and the uh, NIHR Academy's fellowship programs. Um, Jenny also worked with the Academy uh, doing a, a large piece of work around um, looking at the evidence of uh, the impact of the fellowships and, and that helped to inform and guide uh, where we are as, as an Academy at the moment. So um, Jenny is going to speak to you about the art of selling a project. So thank you, Jenny. The art of selling your project. Um, <clears throat> title of my job, Professor of the Psychology of Healthcare, but that's quite misleading really. Um, I'm a research methodologist primarily. Um, and my current involvement with NIHR is via the, uh, one of the incubators, so the research methods incubator. Um, that's what I'm up to now. In the past, as uh, Anne-Marie has just indicated, I've spent quite a bit of time in different roles for an IHR. Um, and I thought I'd put this up because you, talking to you today about how to sell your ideas, um, the theme of how I'm going to present it is you've got to think about your readership. So specifically, and if you like personally, imagine your reader okay now the background for me was uh so hta did and does trials so i've been deputy chair of both of the different boards so the commission side and the clinical trial side um and then as Anne marie's just briefly said i've also um panel been a panel chair for some of the other awards and particularly um the program grants and the fellowships so that's my background. Now, <clears throat> ask to tell a room full of people of very diverse stories themselves how to go about selling your project. Well, one thing I decided I wasn't going to do, make this thing work to start with. There we go. One thing I thought I wouldn't do, because possibly the most boring talk I ever personally attended was when somebody said, well, there's quite a lot of different things you need to take into account. 37, 52, I don't know. And the person started and went down the list. So I just thought I'd tell you, I'm not going to do that. So you can all rest assured. Do I point this at something? Ah, I know, I've got it. Instead. So I want you to imagine the readership, me for example, then I'm going to ask you to think about what you are going to ask me to read. Oh. <laughs> Short of stature, thank you sir, thank you sir. Something about small things in packages, I don't know. Um, anyway, so what... <laughs> what you were going to ask me to read. Um, so I'm a big fan of the distinction between ends and meat. Um, so you're going to present me with something to read um, and it's got to be about answering a particular question. Primarily of your choosing, although it might be within a framework, which more in a minute. And then we have to talk about the means, how are you going to answer that question? Um, the rationale for that question? feasibility of how you're going to go about it um, and then lastly um, who is involved in this enterprise besides you no there is an art to this sir at the back he swears to me it's easy there we are anyway so we're still imagining the readership we are people doing a job 
we're people, we're not robots. And I'm slightly overdoing the thing about imagine who's reading it. So I've had an introduction about the kind of thing I'm used to doing. But I've read an awful lot of these, but I'm still a person, not a robot. So you've got to think really carefully about who's doing the reading. Um, NIH has a generic funder. It's not like the BHF. It's not like Cancer Research UK. Some of the points I'll make you will notice, obviously, have been covered by, by some of the other speakers, which I guess is a good thing in some ways. So all panel members are, to some extent, generalists. You have to be, because certainly as a chair, Gary mentioned, you know, you might have 20 applicants. Well, I would have to read them all as a chair. So I would go from reading something about the genetics of deafness to something about, you know, the organisation of mental health services, to something about et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, generalists. Um, as panellists, the job's to uh, follow an argument. Um, and, and I feel like a professional wet blanket here, actually. Because um, we've just had sort of uplifting talks about selling you, yourself, and I'm here to help you sell your project and I'm immediately going to be a wet blanket and say what I've learnt to be good at is spotting flaws in arguments. So as well as the upbeat stuff, you've really got to have your case hanging together. You really, really have to. That's what I do. That's why I'm there. Okay. So basically, this is self-evident like applying for a job. Does the application get over a very basic threshold? Is this fundable? A bit like, is this person a pointable? And then, well, if it's fundable, why would I fund that and not fund something else? What, what makes this better or better value or some combination? And we have to decide this in the context of broader issues. You know, I was putting these slides together <clears throat> and so often with these things you think, you look and read, you know, you're pretty good at taking exams of different sorts, you're good at reading stuff. Somebody can say to you, these schemes have remits, go away and read the remit and you go, yeah, yeah. And then I think, do they, do they really understand how important that is? Um, the panel members know the funders remit and the programme remit. And it's really important that you do as well. So, okay. So, funder and programme remits. This is me, and this is true. One of these days I might encounter this chap, I hope not. Um, interviewing a supremely, and I do mean supremely, self-confident fellowship applicant. Me. Quite a mechanistic series of studies, you know. Where are you planning to apply for the main trial of funding? applicant beaming broadly, uh, the HTA programme. Well, of course, he didn't know that I was a deputy chair of the HTA programme. He didn't know that. Um, so me, funders have remits in terms of the types of questions. Daddy, daddy, have you read the remit of the HTA programme? Stricken applicant, uh, no. Anyway, you can guess the rest. So what I'm trying to do here is not tell you the remit of whatever it is. It's tell you why you should read the remit, because they care. They know. If you're not sure, ask. Secretariat people are very happy to be asked. If you're not sure, read the remit. Right, what else is in the minds of the panel? Current policy, context, potential for impact. Yes, we know them as well. Um, so, read the news, the policy statements of major stakeholders, not just the academic literature on whatever it is. Come back to that. Um, avoid overclaiming. It's all a balance, you see. We've, we've come onto this before. How do you sell something and say it's valuable without overselling? So, avoid overclaiming. 
I can't tell you how many breakthroughs I've read about. I can't tell you how many transformations I've read about. And you just go, really? Really? It has to be, it has to hang together. Be explicit about how exactly this project could fill a knowledge gap that matters. So think of a chain of bits of information and each project fits bits, fills bits. Now yours might be the one at the end, immediately prior to patient benefit, in which case you've got a slightly easier job to do in explaining how it would work and benefit patients. But it might not. It might be further up the chain of argument, it might be a methodological piece, it might be a more um, experimental medicine type piece, depending on the remit. And that would enable the rest of the dominoes to fall. So you've got to be clear where your gap is and how you're going to fill it and what difference it'll make when that gap has been filled. So tick tock, tick tock, all the way down. So for an IHR in particular, obviously there are other funders, it's all about a plausible, plausible path to patient benefit. Speak to me. Right, okay. So that's current um, policy context. What about the particular call? Is it a commissioned call? So, you know, uh, applications are invited in and the HTA still regularly puts out a shopping list. Or is it investigator driven? Is it up to you? Um, maybe it's not one or the other. Maybe it's a theme um, or a spe specific stated set of priorities. Um, so, for example, there might, a few, few years ago now, there was a sort of dementia themed call and it went across all of the different programs. Um, now, and this has been touched on as well, is it for a project? project development work like a pilot or a feasibility study or something like that or a personal award. Um, the exercise that Anne-Marie just outlined for you is a project application but Gary mainly talked about personal awards so I'll very briefly mention that distinction again at the end but you've got to be clear which it is. Budget, time frame, duration. Barn door obvious, does the application you're putting together fit the spec? Money, time, the lot. Which leads us to your question. Okay, here we go again. What's the question you're proposing to answer? This is my colleague this time, another true, true example. We shared this in the office many times, advising a would-be applicant. It's another mechanistic study. Quite a mechanistic study. It does say in the funding call that's not what they're looking for. Have you thought of another funder? So you're thinking, you may be thinking I'm telling you the same anecdote twice, not quite. Um, applicant looks puzzled. So my colleague tried to clarify. Funders have remits, dum de dum de. Um, they do mean what they say. This person interrupted her, shook his head like that, and said, probably tutted, I don't know, um, and said, quality will out. Okay, what he meant was, this is such a good idea. Doesn't matter what the remit is, they're gonna be so impressed they're gonna fund it anyway. Okay, now I've given you two examples with these of how important the remit is. The first person, the confident chap about the HTA, he hadn't even read it. This one had read it, but he thought it didn't apply to him. Trust me, trust us when we say it applies to you. Okay, so we're going on a bit. What is the question? So I've given you the background, set up your readership. What's the question? How big or pressing is the problem? In whose opinion? Some of this is code for, it's not just the academics. You'll hear more about the importance of other perspectives later on. Certainly members of the public and patients. Um, how expensive is it in, in multiple respects? 
again, more than one set of stakeholders. How does your question relate to the research literature? That's the sort of obvious bit. And to current practice. So finding another way of doing something we do quite well already might throw light on mechanisms, but it's probably not going to make much difference to patient outcomes. So just rediscovering another way of doing the same thing is not up per se fundable. You've got to say why it's beneficial. And of course, there are many intractable problems, as we know. Um, others have tried, and there is still a problem. Why might you succeed when all of these other people haven't? And lastly, how plausible is this claimed causal chain that I've mentioned between your bit and ultimately patient benefit? And again, I stress, not all projects have to be that last bit, but they have to be part of a chain of argument. And both logically and, if you like, quantitatively, that has to hang together. Otherwise, it's wishful thinking, really. A bit of a policy reminder. Sorry, that's quite a long slide. You're not really supposed to read all this. It's the top bit. So, um, I don't know how you say it. Harveyan, as in Harvey. Um, this was Chris Whitty um, making his case that the research enterprise that, if you like, he inherited was failing s certain sectors of society. So it led to the INCLUDE project, which is um, meant to improve the inclusion of underserved groups in clinical research. So you can, you can all read, you can read these, they're easy to find. I've highlighted the bottom bit. So important differences in how a group responds or engages with interventions, with research neglecting to address these factors. So Chris Whitty was saying this isn't good enough. We have to do better than that. And you have to take that on board as well. That is run through everything we do now. Quite rightly, there was a lot to, that needed to be done better. Right, so we're moving on to how you're going to answer this here question. The rationale and the feasibility. And I've put up a really, really simple schematic there, um, which again, you know, any of you could have written on the back of the proverbial. Um, but it's surprising how poor the linkage can be sometimes. Um, no. <laughs> This, this is me being a bit mischievous, I'm afraid. Does anybody know who that is? It's the great William Harvey. So he of blood circulation and all the rest of it. Very famous. Um, espousing the experimental method. So he said, don't think, try. As in experiment. And um, I've stuck on the bottom, well, maybe. Now, what that's about, and again, this is, you'll never see this written down anywhere, but it's true. How you plan your question, think about the, so we've talked about your question, think about the design, and have, again, to RCT or not RCT, that is the question. Well, that's, you know, Shakespeare. Um, research design is taught all over the place. I'm not teaching you research design. The point of bringing it up here is that all methods have their pros and cons, including RCTs. What we want you to do is choose the right method for your question. Remember that blue question design data? It is not a beauty competition. Now, maybe where you work it's different, but the places I've worked, Again, I could give you little examples of people coming and asking me things. Desperate, whatever the question was they started with, to end up with a randomised trial. And it's like it's a beauty competition. It's like, well, my boss will be really pleased or I'll get a really good paper or something of the kind. There is a, there's a tension here, I can't deny it. However, we're saying choose, the question comes first. Choose the design that suits the question 
Let's, let's assume the design suits the question, what about the data? This again is a fundamental. When potential participants are asked to consent to research, some people say yes and some people say no. I'm standing here stating the obvious. Not everybody gets asked. Non-inclusions as a result of that process are patent. They are almost always patent. Methodologists have increasing amounts of fun demonstrating how patent they are and why it matters. Okay. So, and again, some people think that you just bump up the size of your study and that'll solve it. It doesn't solve it. They still, you've just got a large patterned sample. Right, active, anything to do with active self-selection, volunteering, amplifies the patterning effect. So, trying to make sure you hang on to the thread of this argument. Chris Whitty said, we're not serving certain groups of the population. What we learn from the people we do study may not generalise to the people we don't study and they probably have greater needs because that's how the patterning works. So this is why I'm talking about the move from almost entirely thinking about research design to thinking about who is in this study because you're not going to be able to address some of the challenges of underserved populations if you don't think about this. The result, consented data sets differ in composition, whether from unconsented, and that's true whatever your research design. So you're probably going to have to think about ways of acknowledging that. You can't solve it, but acknowledge it and then say how that might, for example, create limitations for the conclusions you could draw, something like that. No. Gone again? I think it goes to sleep. Go on. Ah. Observational designs. Um, you can use this, those all manner of ways. Part of an RCT, substitute for an RCT, preparation for an RCT. Um, however, as in trials, there are now um, far more people wanting to use these fairly readily available data sets like um, UK Biobank or um, some of the ones that you get from NHS Digital. And they do, it, it's a trade-off. So if they're readily available and they're curated to be fairly ready for research use, they have gone through filters. And when you start to look systematically at the effect of those filters, you really have to be very clear whether they're likely to apply to you or not. So Biobank has a very low response rate, does suffer from healthy volunteer effects, and some of the very widely used um, primary care and hospital data sets, less so, but they do go quite a lot of steps before they reach you. Routine data, unfiltered, but as probably anybody here knows who's tried, um, they bring access issues, governance issues, they are not consented for research, and data quality challenges. Now, watch this space. Watch my clock. Okay, I've called it, I've got two runes. Um, I'm not involved in any, you know, uh, powerful committees that decide these things, which is why I've called them runes. But it just seemed absolutely obvious to me that um, when priorities of, um, for example, government, uh, say about public health, about social care, about mental health, again, you know, it's everywhere. Um, and then you think to yourself, how well suited is the evidence base there now for doing a randomized trial? The answer is very seldom. And what worries me sometimes is that people think they have to find a question to suit their method, as distinct from find a method to suit their question. And that is a pervasive problem in um, certain settings in higher education, for sure. Anyway, if you've not come across this, K. 
came out in April. Um, ben Goldacre, who um, as a researcher had put together a thing called Open Safely under special legislation as part of the pandemic. So legislation was introduced which changed the rules about researchers accessing non-research data in the interests of public health, infectious diseases, pandemic. So the law was changed and under the new umbrella law, they were able to demonstrate some of the amazing things you can do if you don't have to fight for access to data. If some of those issues don't arise, then they demonstrated some fundamental um, patterns in, in the um, progress of the pandemic. Um, and those demonstrations have been, as it were, the cornerstone of this um, report um, about using existing data sources. Rune number two. Um, this, uh, there, there's an extra bit, the, the bit at bottom right was just added by me literally yesterday. Um, so there was a, a response to the Goldacre Review from the Secretary of State called Data Saves Lives. Um, that came out on the 15th of June. And then um, just the other day, last week, um, policy paper came out with a clutch of other policy papers. Um, and really what I'm driving up by broadening this is that if you do a research methods course, somebody will teach you about randomization. Somebody will teach you about observational methods. Somebody will teach you about the difference between a cohort study and a case control and all the rest of it. You would be in a very unusual position if somebody taught you about this. But back to the fundamental mismatch here, if the policy priorities are for things like public health and social care, and we're not ready to do RCTs, and if it's also very difficult to get a consented sample that reflects the population most in need, this is where we have to go. And at the moment, we're not really um, preparing people to do these kinds of studies. So my point in telling you all of this today is it's got your message has to hang together because a bit more why so why and how you plan to answer the question I've said all methods have pros and cons there are issues about some of them being prestigious um, and that's partly the consequence of what we've focused on in the past so on the HTA, it was about treatment effectiveness and cost effectiveness. Um, other funders concentrate more on, say, genomics, predicting disease, predicting disease onset, etc., etc. RCTs and volunteer samples, less well suited to this new agenda. So the little arrow thing at the bottom is basically saying to you, try and be whether by talking to people, whether by following, you know, Goldacre, it's publicly available. Try and be up to date with critiques of methods. Because if you're saying we're going to do this, that and the other with this population and you talk about the levels of need and all the rest of it, and then you carefully present a method which any reader now would know, you're not going to get that sample. So be up to date ready to justify your choices, acknowledge the limitations. And again, that last bit. If you're a commissioner, what you want is an answer to the question, the important question that's in people's minds. You don't want a subtly or unsubtly changed question, which the researcher likes better, thinks they'd get a better paper out of, it's a, it's tricky, but, 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 come on, stop my day no more, doesn't want to, no, it doesn't do it, okay, sorry about the, <laughs> shame about the um, tagline, um, 
To recap, question design and data. The question takes priority. Acknowledge limitations, justify choices. And this, the worst possible strategy is to claim you can answer a question when the proposed combination of design and data means you can't. So don't do that. Not much. Oh dear, oh dear. How am I doing? I've got a bit. Right. Solution is to iterate, by which I mean work it out. Maybe if you can't do everything you wanted, settle for a less ambitious version of the original question in terms of a whole variety of things. Choose your um, dimensions that you could trade on. Iterate until you find the best achievable combination of the question and the design and the source of data. Don't, whatever you do, just get on with it. You know, think this isn't working out, but it's going in anyway. Um, and hope somebody won't notice. You would be surprised how often people do that, particularly the bit at the end. So they've realized something in this section and altered it, but they haven't altered it somewhere else. So check that it all adds up. Right, I need to speed up for the last bit. Who's taking part in this enterprise besides you? Um, me, advising a would-be applicant. Uh, this does need the input of a statistician. Who have you approached about it? Applicant, senior clinician. Think of the, choose a voice of your choosing. Um, my juniors are good at that sort of thing. Me again. And um, you can imagine, can't you? Um, advice on constructing the patient questionnaire. Applicant, fed up with all of this, I wasn't doing the job he wanted me to do, um, interrupted me, shook his head and said, my nurses can do all of that sort of thing. So, who is taking part in this enterprise besides you? Uh, thankfully, the days are mostly gone of clinicians assuming they can do the stats, do, whoops, um, mind read everybody else. Um, you've heard this message earlier. Um, Problem-driven research, which is what NIHR is interested in, needs multidisciplinary and multi-stakeholder input. Patient and public contributors in the applicant team, as well as uh, also in the team, as per what you need, providers of care, methods experts, etc. Remember though the underserved populations. Sorry if I'm offending anybody here. If all of those people work in Oxford, for example, in 2022, that's maybe not such a good look. Um, where are the parts of the country in which the services available to these people are not available? If you do need to do more iteration, so be it. What matters to the, and again, Gary had some good suggestions about that and there were some good questions. What matters to the reader is the team you end up with, not the one you started with. Take advice, give yourself some time, be ready to learn, and be a good colleague. Gary hinted at that, and he was thinking of a, a sort of intellectual respect. I would also add a practical respect, so don't send something to somebody the day before it's due in and expect them to finish writing blah blah. Be a good team player. Right, I think I've got, there's about two or three more. Um, who should or could be the lead applicant? And again, you don't see this written about very much. Um, lots of myths about um, track records and professional background and favoured institutions and all the rest of it. Um, funders do differ. NIHR on the whole is not wildly um, impressed by prestige of other kinds. Um, you've got to demonstrate on the ground. Um, so take that seriously, but don't be fobbed off, if you like, by people saying, oh no, you know, it's got to be a clinician who's the lead applicant or something. <laughs> Even so, 
That said, NIHR project awards are contracts, they are business contracts. And the funder has to judge the suitability of the lead applicant, not just to deliver on the science, but to manage the money. Pull all the different bits together, run this show and deliver on time. And if you, as a potential lead applicant, have only got a project that was two k's worth of money on your CV, in all conscience to the taxpayer, I can't say you can be trusted with a two million pound contract. It just doesn't hang together. So, if you're allowed, and lots of the schemes allow you, get a co-PI. It doesn't do you, you know, any harm. You're still a PI, but you're a co-PI. And if that's not allowed, well, downsize for the thing you want to be a PI for and earn your spurs with big project as a co-I. And you can do those in parallel. But the idea that you can go from really not a lot to, you know, two million, three million, it's not sensible. Nobody's going to go along with that. So some places are better set up than others, evidently so. Um, you can work around that, uh, use external trials units or external facilities of other kinds. You can have co-applicants from other places, including underserved areas. So acknowledge, if you like, the limitations of the setup if that's the case that you happen to be working in, but go, I can find ways around. I can develop myself in other ways and I don't have to be restricted in that way. Right, I think a couple of final thoughts. Um, this talk has been framed around preparing a project application. I said that at the beginning. But there are important differences in means and ends between a project and a personal award. And again, Gary touched on this. The end product of a project successfully delivered is the answer to a research question. The end product to a personal award is a better trained person. So for a personal award, you're thinking in terms of how they were when they came to you and how they could be at the end of the three or five years and how to get them there. And that involves a lot of training and development. And the whole point is that you're not the complete article at the beginning. Otherwise you don't need a personal award and training. So it's an important distinction. I was stuck on there because I couldn't resist having interviewed an awful lot of people. Um, if you are in an interview, well done first of all. And if somebody asks you a line of questioning that you can't answer, if you're in a hole, stop digging. And just say, I don't know. I realise now, you know, it is going to be part of my training plan and blah, blah. Um, or, except, I've, uh, you know, I haven't thought this through. I've got some more to do. Don't dig yourself into a justification that's not working. Last of all, um, Whoops. My audience today, I know, comes from infrastructure and capacity building, I think it is, isn't it? Um, and the relevance of all this in some more conservative small C quarters uh, may still need to be explained. Um, because higher ed employment structures are not always sympathetic to uh, career development. But this event is absolute proof of NIHR's interest in you and one of the reasons for the runes was something about pipers and tunes. Who pays? Who pays? That's it. So, thank you very much. Um, so, we have some on questions online? No, we don't. No? Okay. no. Um, can I ask uh, any questions that were from the audience? Um, so, can I ask a question, um, and I think this is going to come up, this whole interdisciplinary team, um, you know, building a team, how do you make sure that um, you don't fall into the trap of a liquish all sorts, I have to have a clinician, a allied health professional, a methodologist. Um, 
any advice about making sure you've got the right people um, to support um, your application? Okay. Um, apart from um, some absolute basics, and you're going to hear more about the contribution that can be and must be made by patient and public contributors, I would regard that as a basic. Apart from that, I would ask you to bear in mind how I've gone through this talk. So I started with the question and then I went on to the how and you're going to go about it and all the rest of it. And then at the end I said, well, and who's involved in this enterprise? And the reason I did it that way around is because the who is driven by the question. So whether it's mixed methods, whether it's health economics, whether it's whatever, if you need that expertise, if I'm looking at an application, I don't want to read qualitative research written by somebody with a completely different discipline background. It's just not, I want the right level in that team. So it's driven by the question. Brilliant, thank you. No further questions? Oh, we, we do. Um, you might want to yell. <laughs> Well, I would, I would say that, wouldn't I? I leave that to uh, my colleagues. But I will say the climate is changing. It's not, and I must say it's not either or. We're not suddenly going to go, no, we don't need trials or we don't need whatever. We're saying we've added to the list of questions we want research evidence to inform. And those new questions are less suited to our main repertoire than some other methods. So, given that, how would you display, how does research persuade the public to allow them to use their data more effectively? Well, that's a question. Um, I think that the research is the most important thing. Um, and I think that the public should be able to use their data more effectively. I have ideas. I mean, I, I think that there have been major missteps. I have, and the, the government now acknowledges that. Sajid Javid acknowledges it in his foreword to the, his response to Goldacre, basically saying, you know, there was this big thing about primary care data, I think it was just last year, and everybody went, huh? Um, Goldacre is very clear, actually. Um, there's got to be some major work on public trust and on the infrastructure that you can describe to a member of the public to reassure them that the use being made of that data would be for the public good, not for profit, not for insurance companies, not for academics, just because they, you know, like those numbers. Um, so it's 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 a big exercise, and you know we have dug ourselves into a hole actually. So we've got to climb out of that hole one way or another. So Jim, you have. Um yeah, we've just got one question from um, the online delegates. Um, so more a personal award question rather than a research grant question. So for a personal award, um, should you have a couple of supervisors? Would it be good to have a project group or an advisory group to help you work through the work packages and influence change? Hmm. Um, as ever, um, I'll defer to um, kind of current practice, which might be a bit different from what I was used to. But again, stuck record, I come back to what it's for. Um, so I would make a distinction between, say, having a couple of supervisors who had pretty active monitoring experience of how the thing was going versus a slightly larger group, a bit like a project advisory committee, where you could consult those on a less, you wouldn't expect them to know what you're doing next Tuesday, whereas, you know, your supervisors ought to know that. Um, so I would, I would think of it in terms of layers, but again, driven by the job that they're doing rather than, you know, we always have one of these and we always have one of these. Can I just follow up with that? So um, it sounds like the question online might have been around doctoral fellowships and certainly for doctoral fellowships, um, there's a formal supervisory team. I think we've moved a long way beyond having a supervisor. You have a, a, a team of supervisors, but not too many. 
um, there, there needs to be um, people, you know, because the, the question is always, well, what, what do you do if they disagree? And believe me, they will. So, um, so usually three to four is probably the maximum. But there's. Um, Would you, that's interesting. Yeah, uh, but you you will also have. Keep in mind, you might have collaborators. Um, you might have uh, mentors. One of the unfortunate um, itera iterations that we have with the advanced fellowship and any of the postdoc is that you don't really have supervisors um, in postdocs, but you do. So often they're called mentors. So what I would strongly suggest for anyone applying for a postdoc award, be it an advanced fellowship, is to tease it out to say, these are my, su my supervisors, academic, if you'd like, partners, supervisors will help me in the academic um, component. Um, these are my collaborators um, and these are my mentors and they and just spell it out that what each member of the team will actually contribute and that way you also um, you're very that makes you it enables you to be a bit clever with word count and participants in your application not that I do this a lot or anything. <laughs> brilliant okay no, that's good Jenny, thank you so much. Um, we're, we're very, very grateful for you coming along um, and sharing your, your wisdom. Um, and wish you were staying, but <laughs> brilliant. So thanks, Jenny.